need to be able to grow meat, essentially manufacturing it or culturing it, rather than from cows and sheep in fields. So it would be like, sorry, a fake meat? No, no, no. no. You uh, take a, a sample from oh, a cow okay. and you use the cells in the sample and you create meat that You're way. You're No, it's very presentist. A man from China made a call and said, do you know the Chinese judiciary has been watching what you've been doing? And we said, no, we don't know that. The man said, China has really excellent environmental laws. Uh, the air quality is very bad in Chinese cities. China now wants to enforce its environmental laws. Would you kindly come, you client Earth, and give a seminar to the Chinese Supreme Court justices on what it is you have been doing, which was a remarkable uh, request. So we did that. Did you doubt of the genuity of the question? The man said, I'm from the Chinese Supreme Court. And we said, yes, of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> we got to the bottom of it. We are the secretary to those discussions between the EU and China. There's something quite remarkable about this, that a little environmental organization, 350 people, without an office sort of just down the road, you would never know it was there, is right in the middle of the dialogue between That's... the EU and China. Wow. Yeah. What an achievement. Yeah. Harvest is in London for a special one-day event. Here we gather renowned artists, speakers and practitioners who are all inspiring us with their take on this edition theme, Tools for Transformation. I hope you enjoy this interview. What are the most pressing environmental challenges we're facing today? Let's ask this question to Howard Covington, my guest today. He's the chair of the board of trustee for one of the leading climate change organizations, Client Earth. Uh, we asked him to choose the three most urgent challenges and we'll ask him now how low fits into the equation uh, of a greener and more sustainable future and what a part we can play to help. Hello, Howard. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Very good to be here. Um, so could you please tell me uh, what are for you the three biggest challenges uh, our planet Earth is uh, facing as human being um, on this planet? So, um, Rose, I don't think I can because I think three ah. is an inadequate number. Why? Uh. Because the you can look at the challenges facing us in any in in several different ways and in each way you can find a whole host of challenges so okay. let me give you an example um, we are uh, pushing the climate through some kind of transition we're warming it up by putting um, uh, by putting carbon into the atmosphere and uh, that all by itself is a major problem um, but we're also taking a scythe to nature everywhere we humans go we are trying to reduce um, biodiversity um, uh, and replace the natural world with the cultivated world or the, or the, or the pasture world on which we put um, uh, cows and sheep and so on. Um, that is um, a, a major problem. Interestingly, we have the technologies to solve the problems we are creating. We know how to stop emissions. Our technologists, our scientists, our entrepreneurs have done a wonderful job in producing what we need to replace fossil fuels with uh, wind and solar and batteries and electric vehicles and nuclear and all the things uh, that we need to run an energy system without fossil fuels. But another big problem is that we don't have the politics to drive this forward as quickly as it should go. And um, I don't need to, to say um, uh, what, what the political problems are in any detail, but uh, just to mention two, 
there is the strategic competition between uh, China and uh, the US um, at a time when one would like them from a climate and nature point of view to be working closely together. Mm -hmm. Within the US there is um, a polarization which is uh, unbelievable in its extent with the possibility that um, the Republican Party by pushing the election of Trump will essentially abandon democracy if they succeed in getting him uh, elected. And if that happened, it would be terrible for the West and terrible for, for the leadership of action on climate change and the destruction of nature. There are deep issues of social justice and fairness. Uh, it is completely understandable that um, some groups uh, within countries uh, and some countries think not enough is being done for them to help them cope with the demands of, of reducing emissions and saving nature. And until the issues of social justice are properly addressed, um, uh, I fear that the energy transition that we need and the action to reduce our attack on nature uh, will not go fast enough. I could go on. Yeah, there so we're, we're more than three now. Issues. Okay. <laughs> but uh, in, in, um, in stating these issues, the interesting thing about them and, uh, is that we, we humans, we know how to deal with each of them. There's nothing yeah. stopping us other than ourselves. We have the technology, we have the money, we can solve the problem. So there is a pathway through this. Okay, wow. So how can we, what's, yeah, what's the future? What, what do you see? What, uh, what's our level of action? What can we do? Each of us is capable of taking action. And there's a great virtue to taking action. If you, if you are optimistic and you take action, you have a sense of some control, you are doing something to solve the problem. Now, um, what we have found, what I have found, is by joining with a group of people who are taking action that, that you feel personally is effective and is in, is in character with, with the way you like to proceed in life, uh, that gives you a great sense of, of making progress. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm referring in my own case to, to Client Earth, mm -hmm. but uh, other people will have other uh, environmental organizations which suit them in a way. Yeah. And I think joining with people to support an environmental organization gives a great sense that, uh, that you're doing something and that you're moving the world towards the solution. So before giving me uh, your actions at Klein Earth, mm. because uh, you're the, the chairman of, um, of the board, can you tell me how you joined uh, this adventure and what does it uh, represent for you? The story of how I joined it is, is, is a slightly funny one. Uh, I um, had a career in the city of London. Um, I was a banker and, and a money manager and uh, I co-founded a business and sold it. And after I sold it, um, I, I had reserved time for um, looking at climate change and the destruction of nature. All the time I was building the business, uh, I knew that this was a growing problem. This was in the 2000s, okay. but I didn't have time to study it. So I did study it, and it didn't take long to study it. There was lots of, by, by 2010 or something, there was, there was lots of information available. I have a scientific background. It was, it was easy to, to pick out the key bits of information and to see where, where the world was headed. And so uh, I, I, I did that. My, my eyes were opened, as it were. And I put together a little presentation and went all around the city talking to my former colleagues saying, let me tell you, I've now had time to study this. This is how it looks, where the climate is changing, we're destroying nature in the end. Uh, this is going to come back to bite us. It, there's going to be a big cost to this and it's going to affect everything we all do. And they all said, um, it's very nice to see you, Howard, but 
you're talking complete nonsense. So <laughs> <laughs> Why would you say that? Because this was in the early 2010s and nobody other than the scientists were, were really thinking about the problems. It wasn't something that was discussed generally. I mean, the, of yeah, course, it's... it was beginning to bubble up, but it hadn't reached the city at all. It hadn't reached the financial okay. institutions. But it didn't discourage you. It didn't discourage me. Uh, and I read about Client Earth and some of the early actions it was taken. And I uh, got in touch with its founder, James Thornton, and we had lunch. And I told him the story I told you, and I said, now I want to sue them. <laughs> <laughs> so who did you want to sue? The, the I didn't mind who I sued. I just wanted to see, I, I had tried to persuade and it didn't work. So, uh, and, uh, and uh, I bumped into- So the big corporations. The, yeah. The, the, the finance, the finance, the finance okay. houses in the city who wouldn't take any notice. Okay. Um, and, there was, the, the, there was at the time, um, I mean, I, one would say nowadays that there were climate deniers, but they weren't really climate deniers. They were just dismissing the whole issue. Yeah. Um, and uh, I thought it would be, I mean, I shared James's view that the best place to have a discussion of climate change was in a court in front of a judge. A judge would weigh all the evidence and Make make a judgment based on the facts. There was no, there was no, there was no dismissal or denial. The judge would would <laughs> would assess the arguments, and um, it was new for Client Earth. Uh, Client Earth uh, was founded in two thousand and seven. We were having this conversation in I don't know two thousand and twelve or something. So, Client Earth was on its way. Uh, it had 40 people at the time, okay. now has 350 people. Uh, the, 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 people have, the, the, the size of Client Earth has grown at 20% a year. It's a startup. <laughs> it was a startup and it's gone through this, this very fast growth. Yeah, middle size now. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah good. We have a 350 mouths to feed every, okay. <laughs> every year. Um, uh, and James and I shared a view that the, that the law was a very powerful tool in bringing about the change of behavior that you need to get emissions reduced and to uh, protect nature. I mean, it's called Client Earth, the firm is called Client Earth, because essentially it's a law firm with just one client, mm -hmm. the Earth. Yeah, beautiful, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so can you give examples of uh, some lawsuits you've, uh, you've won? James was very thoughtful about uh, how, to, how to go about using the law in Europe. He was, a, he was a, a, a lawyer who had won many cases, environmental cases in the US, and he wanted to come to Europe and, and develop um, the same thing here. And he saw that um, the, the, the biggest polluter in terms of pollution per head, the biggest carbon uh, emitter was Poland, where it had um, an energy system completely um, powered by uh, coal-fired uh, generators. And they were pretty old coal-fired generators, so they were pretty dirty. And so he set up an office in, in Poland, and every time there was an application uh, to build a new coal-fired power plant, um, he would bring an action against the applicant to test whether it satisfied Poland's own environmental regulations. Okay. So did the applicant obey the law in making the application? And they never did. We stopped 30 coal-fired power plants. Since we opened an office in Poland, there has not been a new coal-fired power plant. Amazing. Okay. It's absolutely amazing. Um, we have contributed to transforming the attitude of the Polish people and their government to energy generation. And now, of course, they are thinking through how they should make an energy transition. So that was one, uh, one example back from the, two, uh, the 2012, 13, 14, something like that. But 
I mean, another one which I think made Client Earth's name um, in Europe was um, the British the British government and its attitude to clean air. So the British government uh, brought into um, British law the EU regulations for the for air quality. Uh, it then proceeded to completely ignore them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we pointed out in around 2015, we pointed out to the British government that the air quality in British cities was a mile away from what the UK government's own law said it should be. Yeah, crazy, yeah. And the, the British government said, essentially, so what? And so we said, we'll see, so what? And we took, them, we took the British government to court. Um, the British, we took the British government uh, through all the stages of the court up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled the British government wouldn't do as it was asked by the Supreme Court, so we had to take them back again and back again and back again. It was a, it was a case or a succession of cases that lasted, I don't know, something like three years. And finally, the British government accepted, accepted that it had to be, obey its own laws. Oh, okay. So what did it do? Wow. So it brought in um, it brought in a diesel ban. So it's now it's it, it, it decided that diesel cars would be banned from city centres from some date in the yeah, future, yeah, yeah. 2030 or whatever it was. Um, and this was a great victory for uh, the British people because the air in inner cities was awful and it was giving lots of people asthma and mm. it was it was contributing I to remember. early deaths. Yeah. I mean, it was yeah. it was really dreadful. But, and it, so it was a great victory, but it led to two more things. So it's, it, this is a remarkable story. Because at that stage, um, the UK was in the EU, and because we had a court decision in the UK, we could use that court decision as a precedent in Europe. So off we went to Europe, bringing actions in one country after another. And this was just at the time of Dieselgate when the big German motor manufacturers were cheating when yeah. the emissions from their cars yeah, yeah, were sure. tested. And the courts did whatever they could to find in our favor. They wanted to teach these big motor manufacturers a lesson. So diesel bans were introduced in one city after another as we brought these cases. And then the EU saw what was going on and said, it's time to flip from diesel to electric. So we had a, a, we played a role. I don't want to exaggerate what we did, but we had a role, played a role in tipping Europe from diesel cars to electric vehicles. Okay. So that was, a, the, there we were affecting a reduction in emissions on a European scale. It was a brilliant success. A great victory. Even if we talked about uh, about um, electric uh, vehicle with uh, with weight, with weight <laughs> and it's not the perfect solution either. Always, there is no perfection in this world. It's um, you have to move forward in the way that you can move forward. Okay. Uh, there's a there's a there's a second part to my story, which is that um, uh, China. I wanted to come to that. Yeah. yeah. So after, while we were doing this in the UK and in, in Europe, China phoned us up. A man from China made a call and said, um, do you know that the Chinese judiciary has been watching what you've been doing? And we said, no, we don't know that. Um, and they said, uh, the, the, the man said, China has really excellent environmental laws, but they haven't been it hasn't been enforcing them. Uh, the air quality is very bad in Chinese cities. China now wants to enforce its environmental laws. Would you kindly come, you client Earth, and give a seminar in the Chinese Supreme Court to the Chinese Supreme Court justices on what it is you have been doing? Yeah. Which was a remarkable uh, request. 
So we did that. Did you doubt of the genuity of the question? Well, uh, you know, we said, the, the, the man said, I'm from the Chinese Supreme Court. And we said, yes, of course you are. <laughs> 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 we got to the bottom of it. And, yeah. and we went to Beijing. And we went into the Chinese Supreme Court building. And there were the justices. And we gave a seminar. Um, and they, um, they were impressed by what they heard. And they, they said, we'd now like you to train the justices and the prosecutors so that we're right up to the latest international thinking in adjudicate in bringing actions and adjudicating environmental actions and then we're going to start bringing actions so we train we we began a training program for their justices and their prosecutors and after a year or so they started bringing actions and they've been bringing a hundred thousand actions a year 100,000 prosecutions, okay. and uh, they win 95% of them. And if you do business in China now, you, you are very, very cautious about what you put up the chimney or what you dump in the river, because the likelihood is you'll be in court if, okay. you, if you break the law. Thanks to you. Well, no, not thanks to us. Thanks to the decision of the, of the Chinese people um, and the Chinese judiciary to start enforcing their laws. Yeah, because at the time, like Beijing was uh, unbreathable, you couldn't breathe Beijing in Beijing, was and people so were starting to complain a little bit. Yeah, there was a real yeah. social problem, a yeah. real social, yeah. a deep social issue. If you can't breathe, you get upset. I mean, yeah. Um, and so after the after the, the Chinese government had made the decision, uh, all we did was provide a little bit of help. Wow. And uh, that's uh, funny, they come to see um, a mm. European uh, no. organization. So um, uh, China is absolutely brilliant at looking at the world, seeing what is best out there okay. and that can be imported into China. They have no problem at all saying there's something very good over there and we should we okay. should have the same sort of thing here. Okay. So a form of humility. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, uh, it's it's a f it's a it's a very sensible way of running anything, isn't it? You see somebody else doing something really clever, and you say, "I can do yeah. that." If they come and tell me how to do it. What's the next plan with uh, China? There are um, so, so I, I need to. I need to be clear about something here, which is, of course, there is strategic competition now between the West and China. And the, the strategic competition has been uh, mounting over the last few years. And um, we um, deal with that by being strictly non-political. So if we can help any country around the world, we will do that. So um, when you ask me um, what is uh, next with China, we will uh, work with them on anything they would like us to, which um, takes their efforts to reduce emissions and to um, preserve nature forward. So to give you another example, um, after we'd been working with the, the Ministry of Justice for a while, the Ministry of the Environment asked us what we could do. And, um, and we said, well, um, we have a proposal for you. We have noticed that um, uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is a massive, a trillion dollar investment program in 100 countries or something like that around the world, We've noticed that yeah, the, the, belt, uh, yeah. the Belt and Road yeah, Initiative. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, we've noticed that the Belt and Road Initiative is still investing in coal-fired power plants. And yeah. do you know you're going to lose a boatload of money on that because these are all these power plants are all going to become uneconomic. They're going to be stranded assets. And they said, that's very interesting. Would you write? mind writing a memorandum to that effect. So we wrote a two-page memorandum, and it was, of course, uh, translated and then fed in to the ministry, and it went right up. Um, and 
Xi Jinping uh, apparently responded to it and said, we don't want to lose a boatload of money. And down it came again. And then just before the, um, the Glasgow Conference of Parties, the Climate Change Conference, in, I think, 2021, uh, Xi Jinping announced that the Belt and Road Initiative would no longer finance coal-fired power plants. Okay. And you might ask me what, um, to what extent our memorandum was responsible for or contributed to that decision. And as an answer, I would tell you that on the Chinese uh, Ministry of the Environment website, they thank us for initiating that okay. well, in public. So that's that is remarkable okay. that um, that that one decision touches the lives of people in a hundred countries. Yeah. The, the the it may not stop them uh, developing. Uh, their electricity grids using coal, but it will make it a lot more difficult for yeah. them. And at the same time, the costs of wind and solar are coming down very rapidly, uh, with the infrastructure also being supplied by China. So we've just as we contributed to a switch in Europe from um, diesel-powered uh, vehicles to electric vehicles, we've contributed to a switch from uh, coal-fired generation to clean energy in countries all around the world through the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah, because it, it had been said that uh, China at the time, that China wouldn't build uh, coal uh, in its own country, but would put them in Africa and Kenya, for example, in Lamu yes. or things like this. Yeah. And as it happens, the reverse is now yeah. the case. It, okay. It's that's, not doing them outside China, yeah. but it is opening uh, coal-fired power plants very rapidly inside China. Okay. So. But that is Chinese domestic policy. So. Yeah, you get, yeah. You were talking um, about competition. I didn't very understand when you said like um, it's there is a competition between uh, China and the West. Strategic competition. Yeah, strategic competition. So what, where do you why do you mention this? Oh, because um, uh, the reason that I use that language is because the U.S. has designated China as a strategic competitor. Yes. I mean, that's a sort of fighting formal... Fighting for the first place, yeah. Well, they're, they're <laughs> <laughs> I, they are fighting for first place, meaning fighting for... Uh, essentially fighting for the leadership of yeah. the world. And, um, uh, and the fact that there is... I mean, it, the word fight is the wrong word. It is competition. It's yeah. a, they are strategic competitors and of course relationships between uh, China and the US in the last 18 months have been um, have been taught they have not they've not been easy and uh, one would think that since solving the climate problem and indeed solving the problem of the destruction of nature since that is important to both of them one you, you might think that even if they are having a difficult time on everything else, on this one single issue, they might come together and together push the world forward. That could be a good challenge for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly, um, the, the, um, uh, within the departments of, of environment, both in uh, China and in the EU, there are regular discussions that take place on you know how both of them are moving um, their policy forward and they wanted um, a secretary for those discussions who was neutral and acceptable to both and we're it we are the secretary to those discussions between the EU and China and there's something quite remarkable about this that a little environmental organization 350 people with a, an office sort of just down the road you would never know it was there is right in the middle of the dialogue between That's the EU and China wow yeah what an achievement yeah it's, and pressure yes it's I mean we're able to do it because we have no angle on this we just want to see the world in a better place 
Okay, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. So let's talk about the clean transition in its uh, broadened sense, maybe. What is uh, wrong today? And if you could have like an ideal shift in the world, if you could suggest like the best idea and the US and China would agree and the, all the world, what would happen? <laughs> if I had the a magic wand and could wave it and everybody got exactly, on happily. Exactly, yeah. you got this magic wand. <laughs> so um, sadly, Rose, there is not a magic wand. So no. we, we, we <laughs> have to deal yeah. with the world as we see it. Yeah. So um, I, there's a clean energy transition going on. It's, uh, it's an industrial revolution in its scale. Um, it's uh, taking the backbone of the world economy, the, 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 the fossil fueled energy system, and it's replacing it. I mean, this is an enormous thing to do. Uh, But that's only the first stage of the clean tech transition. The next stage is clean food. And this, uh, in my view, this is, this is, um, this is only partly um, talked about and accepted. It's not, not a current view out in the world, but okay. uh, I think it's becoming current, which is that you need to be able to grow food inside, not out in the fields. So in particular, um, you need to be able to grow meat inside in, a, in a something called a bioreactor and provide meat for the world from inside, by essentially manufacturing it or culturing it is, is the word, rather than from cows and sheep in fields. So it would be like, sorry, a fake meat? No, no, no. no. So the, 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 the way that this is done is you uh, take, a, uh, you take um, a, a biopsy, a, a, a sample from oh, a cow. Okay. And you use the cells in the sample to, you, you put them in a reagent which, which, uh, which allows them to multiply and grow and you create meat. You're way. futurists. No, it's very presentist. This is happening. The, the most uh, remarkable thing I have seen in the last uh, few years, two or three years, is a paper which was, I think, in Nature, which had a picture of a Wagyu beefsteak, okay. which had been 3D printed. Okay, the, it was printed not with ink, but with meat cells and fat cells, which had been grown in a bioreactor. But with no massage. The cells, uh, the <laughs> <laughs> they haven't got to the massage. Okay. The, the, the cells had been obtained from a, from a live wow. animal without okay. doing it any harm. Now, and the nutrients are there? The, it's all, yes, all there. yes. Okay. The, so this is at an early stage and, and you, you, you The growth medium needed is, is very costly at the moment. The steak, I think, costs a million dollars to make. I mean, Wagyu okay, is expensive, okay. but it's not generally a million dollars. No, no, no. Well, uh, yeah. um, um, the, the, uh, you, you, need to, uh, you need to have a, an economic growth medium. You, I mean, you need lots of technology here. But if you can do it at a million dollars, you can do it in a few years' yeah, time yeah, yeah. at $10,000 and then $1,000 and you'll end up. So that's a big hope. No, it's not a big hope. It's a reasonable expectation given the way that technology has worked over the last 30 years. I don't think it is a big hope. I think you need a bit of luck and a lot of creativity and you'll get there. And the reason I mention this um, is for two reasons. You, you need to sort out the food supply chain and bring it indoors rather than outdoors for two reasons. One is to take the pressure off nature. If you, if you produced all meat in the way I've just been describing, you could reforest all of pasture land. That would solve half of climate change because the growing trees would suck down yeah. carbon. That would be amazing. It would sort out biodiversity loss. And the third thing, if you did that, uh, it would give enormous food security. You could do this in any country, in any, in any place. And as the climate changes and makes 
growing food in a field more difficult you would be able to grow it inside so this is speculative this is yeah. uh, this is looking a f the best scenario a possible okay. this is looking a decade or two forward okay. but i suspect there will be rapid progress here yeah so do you think our grandchildren will eat could potentially eat that kind of meat yeah uh, so uh, there's a restaurant in singapore selling chicken nuggets made this way okay all right now not okay, for our grandchildren. Very expensive, uh, you can nuggets. go there and eat yeah. it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow, crazy. What are the other, um, because I think it's like something like science is helping. Uh, do you think science will uh, solve the problem so, of uh, environment? So the, nothing will solve the problem. There's no one thing that will solve the problem. But the scientists and the technologists and the entrepreneurs are amazingly um, creative. Yeah. And in the laboratories now, uh, it, universities around the world, are all sorts of new ideas being developed. Yeah. So uh, um, one new idea being developed in Canada is um, deep geothermal energy. So one associates geothermal energy with bubbling pools in, in um, where the, 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 or bubbling lava close to the surface. But if you drill down far enough, you can find hot, you can find hot rock, seven, 10 kilometers. There's a completely new technology which people are trying to develop and then make economic, which would allow you to drill holes anywhere in the world and use geothermal. That's one idea. There are lots of ideas out there. I'm very, very optimistic that the, that the technologists and entrepreneurs will keep providing new ideas. The trick is now to get the politics in place to push this transition forward fast enough. Wow. Thank you so much, Award. We'll, uh, start, we'll finish with the harvest of the day, uh, which is what's your favorite uh, tool for um, self-transformation or transforming the planet or ourselves? Can I do self-transformation? Yes. So my favorite tool for self-transformation is my wife. <laughs> Veronica. Ever gives me guidance on how I need to transform myself. <laughs> okay, but I think you're doing enough to transform the planet, so <laughs> we can give you this one. And well done, Veronica. Uh, thank you so much. My Award. pleasure. Uh, for uh, this very uh, informative and uh, optimistic uh, interview. And uh, thanks for uh, being with the Harvest because we've been, we part you participated in the first one. Yep. I was not there, but uh, it was a few years ago, seven years ago. Yep. Yep. And uh, here you are in London. So thank yeah, you so much. Thank, thank you, you Howard. All right.